Biden has no core convictions. If he needs to be a racist to gain power, he'll be a racist. If he needs to be anti-gay marriage, he'll be anti-gay marriage. He doesn't really have any core convictions. He's just simply going to say whatever it is that he needs to say. He's an empty suit. He's a man with a for sale sign around his neck. And America's enemies have readily perceived this in him, whether it's Ukrainians or the Chinese. Who own him? Who own him? You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Welcome into Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. And I want to begin today's podcast with a letter, and it's a beautiful letter that I received from a man who, in university, uh, he taught my Old Testament survey class. I had him for um, a semester. I won't say his name. I'll preserve his anonymity. Uh, but somehow, amazingly, uh, he remembers me. He tells me in this letter, uh, that he is 89 years of age, 89 years of age. And I love the fact that he adheres to the old school tradition of writing an actual letter that's laid out with a proper format. But he says this, Dear Larry, I've just completed listening to your podcast about the U.S., Ukraine, and Russia. Recently, I've watched your presentation with Sasha. I sent a link to a friend who also appreciated seeing it. I had also lent her your book, The Grace Effect. And then he says some things that are, that are quite personal. Um, and then he says this, the reason I consider your ministry worthy of my support is because of what I learned by viewing your podcast. I've been teaching and preaching the Bible for over 70 years now. It's incredible. 70 years of faithfully teaching Scripture. But viewing your work gives me a grasp of world conditions I get no other way. And uh, I just wanted to read that because, A, I thought it was just very kind, very thoughtful to send me um, a letter of that kind. And again, I'm just amazed. You know, I had him in 1985. And at that point in my life, I hadn't yet figured out what I was going to do with my life. I didn't really have a vision for my life. I was a very mediocre student, so maybe he remembers me for my mediocrity. <laughs> but whatever the case may be, um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just flattered that he would send me such a kind letter. And I want to tell members of the posse, the, the people who follow this podcast, um, that I do my best to keep up with the comments. Sometimes it's very, very difficult in a podcast like this that gets so many 
comments, but I do my best. I will tell you the longer they are, the less likely it is that I will read them. And it's just simply because I just don't have the time. So if it's more than a couple of sentences, it's pretty hard for me to read them. Doesn't mean you shouldn't put comments like that because other people, you know, may read them. But just so you will know, I do my best. Now today, what we're doing on this podcast is I'm going to demonstrate to you beyond a reasonable doubt who the real president of the United States is. I think this question matters because, you know, I just returned from Europe. I've been in Europe a couple of times this year. I've spent about four months over there this year, three and a half, four months, something like that. And a question that I very frequently get is, who's in charge? I mean, who's really the president of the United States? It can't be Joe Biden. I mean, no reasonable person thinks that Biden is in charge of his own faculties, much less in charge of the country. Uh, even Biden's more rational supporters, and there are just a few, recognize that the man is in a state of sharp mental decline. There was a there's a headline, and there's been many of these, but one in particular caught my eye from the Western Journal headline says psychiatrist colon Biden has symptoms of dementia. Likely he is, quote, almost just holding on. End quote. I think most reasonable people would agree with that, and we've all seen it. But just in case you haven't, or because you have refused to see it, let me take you down mental decline memory lane. Not his memory, but our memory, as we take a look at some of the gaffes that this uh, um, man has uh, has made over the course of his term in office. Now, let's start with, and by the way, there's so many of these videos, it was hard to determine which ones. I could do a full podcast that is just simply a montage of these gaffes. It's almost daily. I mean, they, they don't make headlines in part because the left controls uh, major media, but also in part because it's no longer news. I mean, we all know that he is in a state of major, major mental decline. We recently had some monumental news that no one is talking about. For the first time in our history, the interest we pay on the national debt surpassed every individual budget item except Social Security. That's right, the U.S. now spends more on interest than on national defense or even Medicare. And it's only getting worse as big government continues to spend like drunken sailors. That's why savvy investors, central banks, and concerned savers are turning to gold, something not tied to the inflated U.S. dollar. You can, too, with the help of Birch Gold. For over 20 years, Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans protect their savings by converting an IRA or 401k into an IRA in physical gold. To learn more, text IDEAS to 989898 and claim your free, no obligation info kit on gold. Birch Gold has earned my trust and their education-first approach, their thousands of happy customers, and their countless five-star reviews are all reasons why you should invest in Birch Gold. Protect your savings today. Text IDEAS to 989898. But let's start with this one. I've tried to choose a few that might be more insightful or perhaps amusing. Well, we're going to win and we're going to help. We have plans to build a railroad from the Pacific all the way across the Indian Ocean. We have plans to build in, 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 in Angola, one of the largest solar plants in the world. I can go on, but I'm not. I'm going off script. I'm going to get in trouble. So there he is. There he is stating we're going to build a railroad across the Pacific Ocean and across the Indian Ocean. That is one hell of a railroad. That is impressive. I mean, the Trans-Siberian Railroad is considered to be a, you know, almost almost a, a man-made wonder of the world. The railroad stretching across the United States, the Eisenhower 
interstate system are marvels of human engineering. But Biden, he plans to make the pyramids look like nothing. And that's because they're going to build a railroad across the Pacific and Indian Oceans. That's, that's very impressive. He then goes on to end, he, he goes on to end that particular presentation by saying, God save the queen, man. The queen was dead when he made these remarks. God save the queen, man. The queen was already dead. And make note of the fact that he says at the end of those comments, I'm going off script. I'm going to get in trouble. Now, we'll come back to this in just a moment. Then we have this one. This is him at the Naval Academy. He falls down. He falls down. He's being helped up. And then he kind of wanders about here, but he's being directed as to where he should go. Now, you don't have to be an ill mental health to fall down, but it's the way he fell down. And it's a clear indicator that there's something off. There's something wrong. Then we have a video of him falling, boarding Air Force One. Fall number one, fall number two, fall number three. All, all while boarding Air Force One. Gets to the stop, top of the ladder and uh, the steps, and, uh, and then he turns and salutes. And then this is maybe my favorite comment right here. Another guest. And you're elected the highest ranking black Indian with Indian background <laughs> woman in American history to be vice president. We elected the highest ranking black Indian woman in history. Just, it's just one gaffe right after another. But I'm not done. Let me give you another that's also very, very interesting. How about this one right here? And I want to thank all of you here for in including bipartisan elected officials like Representative Governor, Senator Braun, Senator Booker, Representative... Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. Now there he is wondering where Jackie Volorsky is. Where's Jackie? Jackie, you here? She said she's going to be here. Where's Jackie? Jackie had been killed. This congresswoman, a Republican congresswoman, had been killed in an automobile accident along with two of her aides, two of her staffers. But there's Biden wondering, where is she? Where is she? Where's Jackie? Wondering where she is. Then we see this one, and this is possibly my favorite. And particularly watch the faces of the people behind him here because he's reading from a teleprompter and he reads the notes to him, the parts that he's not supposed to read aloud. It's noteworthy that the percentage of women who register to vote and cast a ballot is consistently higher than the percentage of the men who do so. End of quote. Repeat the line. Women are not without electoral and or political or, or maybe precise, not and or or political power. End of quote. Repeat the line. He's reading the notes within the teleprompter script that are just meant for him. They're not they're not meant for the public's consumption. But there he goes. He's just he's just reading it all. I mean, they could put anything. It's like uh, Ron Burgundy. You know what? What's that show? The Anchorman. Is that what it's called? Anchorman, where they the joke is that they could put anything in the teleprompter script and he'll read it. Here's Ron Burgundy sitting in the Oval Office who is making these incredible gaffes. Now, again, honestly, it was hard to choose which videos to show. We could we could do an we could do an, not just an entire show. We could do a series of shows just on these, you know, almost blooper reel kind of things that we see from Joe Biden. He is in a state of major cognitive decline. He's 
you know, one, one, one video uh, that I recall shows him getting off of Marine One, walking to the White House, and you have a Secret Service member, at least I think it's a member of the Secret Service, standing in front of him on the sidewalk, directing him to turn and to go into the White House. He walks straight on, just right off into the garden, all the way around the bushes, and then doubles back to the White House. And how about, how about after the school shooting, the trans school terrorist shooting at a Christian school in Nashville, where Biden making comments on this terrorist act keeps making repeated references to ice cream. As we go through life, the years bring us wisdom, experience, and memories we hold dear. Yet with age, our health often faces new challenges. It's a natural part of life, but it's crucial to address these changes with the right care and attention. For me, one of the ways to stay sharp is to supplement. I've been using liver health formula, and I recommend you try it for yourself to see the results that it can bring. And right now, I think is the time to start taking care of your liver because there is a silent epidemic affecting 100 million Americans. One in three Americans suffer from an overworked and sluggish liver. It affects our weight, energy levels, clear thinking and productivity, and even sleep. Our livers get bombed every day with GMOs, microplastics, toxins, and all the stuff that you might not even know about. Liver Health Formula can support your liver to minimize the impacts of all of this. It is a premium supplement designed with 11 clinically proven botanicals to support and detoxify your liver, helping you feel revitalized and ready to conquer each day. Just listen to Mr. Harrington's testimonial, who shared his transformative journey. At first, I was skeptical, but the health improvement has been nothing but amazing. The tired, foggy feeling I've had is gone. I have more energy for a longer duration. Also, the service and delivery is always prompt. Of course, results are not typical, thus you have to see for yourself. There's an exclusive deal for my audience. Head to getliverhelp.com forward slash Larry. And as a special offer, you'll get a free one month supply of nano powered omega 3s with your order. That's getliverhelp.com forward slash Larry. Twice cream. It's just like the man isn't there. And that's because he isn't all there. Now, I have long maintained that he doesn't write his own tweets. And now, now we have hilarious evidence of that fact. His press secretary, a comment went out that was meant for, it was meant for Biden's presidential Twitter account or X account, if you want to call it that. But it went out instead on the press secretary's account. And so the press secretary's account said this. We'll put the image of this tweet on the screen. Investing in America means investing in all of America. When I ran for president, I made a promise that I would leave no part of the country behind. I remember seeing the tweet and thinking, did she run for president? I don't remember her running for president. Well, of course, it wasn't meant to go out on her account. It was meant to go out on uh, Biden's account. And then you have, you know, as we, we show you the image of this tweet, you see at the bottom where it says, this post has been deleted. <laughs> Immediately deleted, but it was a sure indicator to all of us what we already knew, and that is, that not just that he's not really the president of the United States, he's not doing his own tweets. He's not writing his own speeches. He's not determining what he does and doesn't say. And it's only when he gets off script that he really does get in trouble. And all of this reminds me of that 1980s movie, Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's, maybe it was early 90s, I, I can't recall, but Weekend at Bernie's was so funny. You know, it was... Uh, you know, this silly uh, movie about a couple of guys who are trying to climb the corporate ladder and they're invited by their boss, you know, to, I don't remember, to some beautiful island where they're going to enjoy a weekend. And when they get there, their boss, Bernie, is dead. But they decide, well, gosh, this kind of ruins the weekend. <laughs> 
let's just pretend that Bernie is still alive and we won't tell anybody he's dead until the weekend is over because we want to enjoy, you know, the champagne, the food, the pretty girls, the, you know, the yacht. We want to enjoy all of that. And so they carry Bernie around with them. They, they, uh, they put him in the boat with them. They put him in the car with them. They take him wherever, wherever they are going. This is Joe Biden. This is the presidency of Joe Biden. It is weekend at Biden's. The man is being, being it's four years of it, not just a weekend. The man is being used. So we return to our question. Who is the real president of the United States? Who is, as I put it, the puppeteer? Who's the puppeteer? Now, before answering that, let me address an important question in understanding all of this. At least I think it's a very, very important question. And I am going to demonstrate to you beyond the shadow of a doubt who the real president of the United States is. Many of you could probably guess, but I'm going to offer you evidence as to who the president of the United States is. But we have to, we have to build our case logically. We have to build it systematically. And the next place, you're seeing that the man is, is in a state of, you know, rapid onset of dementia. That's building block one. The second part of our case is we have to get to Biden's character. Biden's character, the fact that he is in a state of cognitive decline doesn't necessarily mean that he would allow himself to be used. There are plenty of people who are in a state of, states of cognitive decline who do not allow themselves to be used. They're very, very difficult to be controlled, actually. But that's not Biden. That's not Biden. Would Biden allow himself to be used like this? I mean, he's not completely gone. There's there's still something of the old Biden in there. And the old Biden is an, is an evil man. We shall, we shall see this. But what evidence do we have? Well, first, there are the many times that he has said something to the effect of, I'm going to get in trouble. Now, we saw that in the first video that we just showed you where he says, I'm getting off script and I'm going to get in trouble. He has said that many times. You will see headlines that have addressed this, how Biden consistently speaks of the fact that he's going to get in trouble for saying this or for saying that. And that's a clear indication of what we all know. He has handlers. He has handlers. Just as people are tweeting on his behalf, he has other people who are determining the script for his whole life, everything that he does. So that's the first bit of evidence. The second bit of evidence that I would offer is that Biden has no core convictions. If he needs to be a racist to gain power, he'll be a racist. If he needs to be anti-gay marriage, he'll be anti-gay marriage. We have old videos of him as a senator uh, saying the most racist things, stating in, I think it was, I don't know, 2008, 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, that he's against gay marriage. So he doesn't really have any core convictions. He's just simply going to say whatever it is that he needs to say. And then there's finally the third bit of evidence that I would offer here regarding Biden's character, that he would allow himself to be used in this way, is that he has a clear lust for power. You see it over the course of his career. Many people have suggested, I see this sometimes in the, uh, in the comments, and I hope the posse will correct people on this point. They'll say that Biden is everything from a socialist to a globalist to a fascist. They're all variants of the same thing, by the way. But I maintain that he's none of those things. And again, that's because he is not a man with core convictions beyond that which is selfish, beyond that which just advances his own ambitions. He's not committed to any ideology. He just isn't. He's an empty suit. He's a man with a for sale sign around his neck. And America's enemies have readily perceived this in him, whether it's Ukrainians or the Chinese, who own him, who own him. I mean, we know, 
We know beyond a reasonable doubt that this man has been selling influence around the world through his son, Hunter Biden, who also has no core convictions. This man is for sale. So do I think that Biden would allow himself to be used? You betcha. If it helped him advance his own ambitions. And I think that the more cynical types who would be looking for someone like this, they would perceive it in him immediately. Listen, listen to these comments. These are amazing remarks in my mind that have gotten very little play. And um, I, I really feel like they, they need they need to be played in an endless loop because they tell us a lot about who he is. Now, this is Joe Biden as a 29-year-old senator. Listen to what he says here. Senator, I'm sure that, that you would agree that, that your service in the Senate up to this point has, has not reflected any particular concern for the larger contributors. Well, the fortunate thing is I didn't have many larger contributors. And the only reason, see, I went to the big guys for the money. I was ready to prostitute myself in the, man, in the manner in which I talk about it. But what happened was they said, come back when you're 40, son. And so I had to go out. Well, I had to go to a number of small contributors. Well, I, I think we're all grateful, Senator. You now, that actually is an astonishing line. It blows me away that the audience laughs. The audience laughs. Are they laughing nervously? Maybe they're laughing because they think he's joking. They think he can't really mean that. This is a clear indicator of who this man is. I went to the people with the big money and I was prepared to prostitute myself, he says. I was prepared to prostitute myself. And the audience laughs at this. That is should have been a moment where people say, oh, wow, oh, wow, he's just told us who he is. This is somebody that cannot hold public office. This is a man of very low character. But they seem to think that he's joking. They seem to think that he is joking. During the same interview, he says this, well, I'm not sure you should assume I'm not corrupt, but I'm thank you for that, though. The I'm not sure that you should assume that I'm not corrupt. And that comes on the heels of the interviewer saying to him, you know, you know, we, we, we know you're not corrupt. We, we, we can assume, we can trust that you're not corrupt. And Biden says, no reason for you to think that. No reason for you to make that assumption. And there isn't a reason for us to make that assumption. Biden, as a 29-year-old senator, told us who he was in this interview. He tells exactly who he was. A, I am corrupt. And B, I am prepared to prostitute myself to the highest bidder. I'm prepared to sell myself. This is who he is. You see, people like Obama and Hillary and Ilhan Omar and globalists like Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and Yuval Noah Harari are, as I have said repeatedly on this podcast, they are ideologues. They're ideologues. Or as we say on this podcast, ideologues, idiots. They're committed to ideas. They see human beings as less important as the philosophy to which they've committed themselves to whether it's environmentalism, whether it's Islam. And by the way, I would suggest to you that Ilhan Omar, she is 100% a committed Muslim. She's happy to play along with the radical left to achieve power, which is a, which is a Muslim tactic. But she's not committed. She's not committed to the radical leftist view. Not at all. She is a radical Muslim seeking power, seeking to subvert the United States. She's got she's got her own agenda that she's following. But like in Obama, like a Hillary, but especially like in Obama, she is full of hate. She is full of hate for the American people, just as Obama is. These are all individuals. These are all individuals who are ideologues. They are ideologues. They are idiots committed to evil philosophies. But that's not that's not Joe Biden. That's not who he is. 
People like Joe Biden and John Kerry and Nancy Pelosi are ideologically vacuous. They are, as I say, empty suits, people with four sale signs around their necks. They are whatever they need to be to achieve their ambitions. Anyone looking for, if listen, if I am, if I am a billionaire, hell bent, I, a George Soros type, hell bent on the destruction of the United States, and I'm looking for someone I can back as president of the United States, as a, as a candidate for president of the United States, I'm looking for a guy like Joe Biden. I'm looking for a guy like that with whom I can make a Faustian bargain. And I would readily perceive in Joe Biden that he is a man who is prepared to sell himself. He is prepared to sell himself. Have you ever seen the film, A Man for All Seasons? Have you ever seen that? Talking over here to, um, to our producer. Um, you should watch it. I think it's maybe 1965 or so. Uh, I think one picture of the year. It is... Uh, based on the screenplay of Robert Bolt. And it is a brilliant screenplay. Now, it's not brilliant history. It is the story of Thomas More and his relationship with Henry VIII and his refusal to grant Henry VIII a divorce um, from Catherine of Aragon because uh, he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. And uh, it really makes Thomas More a hero and a, a martyr who was later, you know, canonized by the Catholic Church. Again, it's it's bad history, but it is a brilliant screenplay. Um, terrific, you know, one-liners, you know, in that. But one of the characters, and this actually is accurate, is Thomas Cromwell. And Thomas Cromwell was a man who was out for power. He was out for prestige. He was extremely ambitious. He was a young man who was apprenticed in a sense to Thomas More, and he essentially sells his soul to those people who are out for Thomas More's blood. He betrays More because he was kind of a part of, I won't say part of his inner circle, but he was close enough to the family to betray secrets to become an accuser against Thomas More. This is Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the Thomas Cromwell character in A Man for All Seasons. Why would I be looking for a Thomas Cromwell-like character if I'm that billionaire, a George Soros-like character? Why would I be looking for a man like Joe Biden? Because I would know he could be controlled. I would know this is a man who is willing to give me whatever I want in exchange for what he wants, which is prestige, self-enrichment, glory. He's prepared to sell his soul to me or to the highest bidder. You see, the puppet masters don't want strong, independent personalities. Such people are not easily controlled. So again, I ask the question, my own question, who is the puppet master? Who is the real president of the United States? Now, many names have been suggested as to who it what might be. I'm not the first person to speculate about this. I hope, I think I'm the first who will lay out for you evidence as to who it actually is. I just mentioned George Soros. And Soros is a popular candidate for this because Soros is a boogeyman of conservatives. And one gets the impression that he likes the status that it gives him, being that boogeyman, that it plays on his ego. His money was used to put radical DAs like Alvin Bragg in office around the country. He's targeted the, the offices of DAs in smaller elections because he knows he can transform the country this way. When you are seeing, you are seeing efforts right now in California to criminalize efforts to stop shoplifters. You know, people are just coming in with bags, trash bags, and they're just knocking things off the shelf into their bag. And you have citizens, law-abiding citizens and security guards and employees who are confronting those people, sometimes in physical altercations. I say more power to you. But there's an effort by Newsom's California to make that illegal, not, not, not to go after the shoplifters, 
not to empower the people who are trying to stop the shoplifters, but to punish those people who are trying to stop the shoplifters. Well, th those are George Soros's policies. This is who George Soros is. But I don't think George Soros is the puppet master here. First of all, Soros is 93 years old, turned 93 last month. I, he has his own handlers these days, and his money is being used to advance his anti-American vision. His son, Alex, is now the guy who is in charge. And no doubt, Alex wields impressive authority on the left. But I don't think he's the puppet master. Another individual who has been suggested is Bill Gates. Now, I've done a podcast on Bill Gates. I've mentioned him in a number of podcasts because he is an anti-liberal. I mean that in the good sense, liberal in the sense of freedom. Uh, real liberalism is a, you know, is a positive thing. It's, it's, uh, it's not a negative thing. So don't associate that with the radical left. They don't deserve to be called liberals. They are illiberal. They are illiberal. But Bill Gates is somebody that I've mentioned because of his illiberal worldview, his anti-human worldview, his evil worldview, the things that he is pushing around the world, like depopulation. And by virtue of his enormous wealth, the man does have influence. But is he the puppet master behind Joe Biden? I don't think so. I don't think that, that he's the guy. I don't think he's the one who was really in charge. Another popular candidate, and the two have met on more than one occasion, is Klaus Schwab. Now, we've discussed Schwab also on this podcast. I devoted an entire podcast to addressing who Klaus Schwab really is. He's the octogenarian German engineer who is the founder and sole chairman of the World Economic Forum. He's a guy who, as I have said, bears an unfortunate resemblance to um, the quintessential Bond villain, you know, played by Donald Pleasance, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. He's the guy that you could picture, you know, petting a cat. And uh, as he's addressing, you know, the World Economic Forum. And then add to that that he has the, the it's unfortunate, he can't help this, but he has the sinister German accent. It just, it just adds to the persona. It just adds to the persona. I would love to see him actually in a World Economic Forum presentation sit and hold a cat. It would be great, you know, if he did that. Somebody needs to snap a shot of him, you know, with a cat that we could use it and post it all over social media. But he's the guy that has become famous for saying, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That sounded more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but anyway. That's my German accent. It's the best I can do. But I don't think that it is Klaus Schwab. I think that Klaus Schwab's influence has been grossly overestimated. Uh, and that is because not, not the World Economic Forum's influence, which I think is quite vast, but I think Schwab is a bit of an embarrassment to the Weffers. They don't really know what to do with him because he founded it. And um, also because he's, you know, kind of Mr. Networker guy. But I think that Schwab is more P.T. Barnum than Blofeld in reality. So do I think he's the puppet master? No, I don't. Others have suggested some kind of globalist cabal. Now, this theory holds that there's a combination of globalists like those that I've mentioned above, you know, people who are members of the World Economic Forum, think big tech and big pharma, um, who work Biden like a sock puppet. They're just, they're just controlling him as if he were a ventriloquist doll. Now, I think this theory holds much more credibility because clearly big tech and big pharma, big pharma perhaps most of all, wield enormous influence enormous influence, uh, particularly since the pandemic began. And that is because the combination of big pharma working with the federal government, working with Democrats, it's, it is an almost unbeatable combination. And that is because on the one hand, you have a government that can force people to take a vaccine. And then you have big pharma 
making big money off of that vaccine. And then you have the politicians who have been forced the vaccine enriching themselves off of this. Some members of government going to work for big pharma after their public careers are over. I mean, we know this is happening. I mean, imagine, you know, Woody Harrelson, who's a bit of a nut, but in his, what they call their cold opening on Saturday Night Live, he was absolutely right when he said this. You can, you can find this online where he said, I mean, imagine a world in which someone forces you to buy their product. Federal government does. They force you to stay in your house. And they tell you you can't come out unless you buy our product. I mean, it's incredible. It would be like the federal government saying everybody must buy this widget before they're allowed to board a plane, enter a public building, or go outside. So is it Big Pharma? I don't think it's Big Pharma, but I don't think Big Pharma is without influence. I think they have massive influence. And then the final candidate, and the one that I think it really is, is Barack Obama. Now, I think most credible evidence points in this direction. And were I doing a poll here, were we to put that down in the comments section and be able to somehow, you know, take a poll, I think most of you would say that it's Barack Obama, too. It's not to say that the others that I've mentioned don't have any influence. I think they do. But the real puppet master here is Barack Obama. And I'm going to demonstrate to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, why that is so. Shortly after Obama took office, just a little story here. Pardon me while I take a drink. Shortly before taking office, or excuse me, shortly after Obama took office, my good friend Dinesh D'Souza, he calls me up one day and he says, hey, you know, I'm going to be in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama for a speaking engagement. Could you meet? Because I want to lay out for you the thesis of a book that I'm working on. And I want you to see whether or not you think the thesis has any credibility. Now, this was Sunday, July 4th of 2010. Sat down in my home and then we went to a barbecue restaurant on July 4th. And I sat and listened as Dinesh unveiled his theory about how Obama thinks. Not how Obama was a puppet master of any kind. You know, Biden hadn't been elected at, at this point. This is, again, 2010. But he was simply laying out a theory as to how Obama thinks to see, again, if I thought that the theory had any credibility. And he says to me, so Dinesh, that is, who is Obama? He said, some think he's a socialist, but his handling of GM suggests otherwise. He continued, is he America's first black president? No, said Dinesh. He, he's kept Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton at arm's length. He doesn't identify with the African-American narrative. And that's because his ancestors weren't slaves. So, who in your opinion is he, I asked. And Dinesh's reply was this. He's an anti-imperialist like his father. Think about it. What was his first act as president of the United States? Now, I had to think about this for a moment, but I wasn't sure what the answer was. And Dinesh said, he answered the question and said, he removed the bust of Winston Churchill from the Oval Office. That was his first act as president of the United States. This was a sign to everyone as to who Obama is. Now, this made sense to me. Indeed, I would argue that it was, was brilliant on Dinesh's part because Churchill was the face of British imperialism, and there's no question that Obama's father was an anti-imperialist. And the, the, the book that Dinesh was laying out for me, the thesis of the book that he was laying out for me that day was his book, what would become the bestseller, The Roots of Obama's Rage. It sent the Obama White House into, into an absolute meltdown and made Dinesh a target. He was, you know, a targeted in a very big way, uh, much, much like to a lesser degree, but much like Trump, honestly. They, he, they, they used the Department of Justice. They, they um, weaponized the Department of Justice against him, and he was accused of all sorts of things. 
But um, the left tried to smear the book's thesis and the author. And the White House even held a press conference to denounce the book as baseless. Now, Obama doth protest too much, methinks. I think it lent a great deal of credibility to Dinesh's argument by protesting to the degree that they did. And that's because it connected a lot of dots. Moreover, in the year since its publication in 2011, I think, I would argue that the book's thesis has been proved. Uh, you know, I recommend the book, The Roots of Obama's Rage. Now, what does this have to do, though, with Obama being the puppeteer working the Biden marionette? Well, let's go back to the bust of Winston Churchill. When Trump, and see that bust, that little statuette of Churchill was a gift from the British people to the American people. And hence the reason it was placed in the Oval Office. Obama removed it and made a lot of excuses about it. Oh, I don't, I love the guy, I think is what he said when he was asked about Churchill. Churchill he clearly didn't. But when Trump was elected president, you know what he did? He immediately put the statue, the bust of Churchill back in the Oval Office. And much to the delight of the British people uh, who had been offended by what, what Obama had done. But then Biden takes office. And guess what he did? Guess what? one of his first acts as president of the United States was. He removed, immediately removed the statue of Churchill from the Oval Office just as Biden had done, excuse me, just as Obama had done. Now, this is no coincidence. In contrast to Obama, who is, as I have said, an ideologue, an ideologue, an idiot committed to a radical philosophy, a radical worldview. Biden is, as I have said, just, just an empty suit, a man with a for sale sign around his neck, an ambitious opportunist who entered politics for personal gain. He has no core convictions beyond that which he deems personally advantageous. Did he come into the Oval Office hell-bent on dismantling Churchill's legacy and his hero status? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He could care less. That's Obama. That's Obama, 100%. Obama is hell-bent on doing that. You got to hand it to Obama in this regard. There are those on the left who aspire to be what Obama is, and I mean this in a very cynical way, not because they're naive about who he is, but because they recognize who he is. Obama is a very good liar. That doesn't speak well of Obama at all. But he's very good at presenting himself to the public as one thing when he's something altogether different. He's something altogether different. Joe Biden is not good at that. Joe Biden gets up and says, reads what's on the teleprompter. But the real Joe Biden, he can't, he can't keep that down. He's, he's constantly playing whack-a-mole with his own character. He's trying to tamp that down. But the fact is, it just vomits out. He can't stop himself from sniffing children. He can't stop himself from feeling up women. He can't stop himself from leering. He cannot stop himself from saying stupid things. Obama recognized this about Biden, even said that about Biden in very crass terms. Leave it to Joe to, quote, F things up. He can do it. That's not Obama. When I'm traveling around the world, but particularly in Europe, which is generally speaking very left-leaning, most Europeans, particularly those with money, are typically left-leaning. When I say something negative about, and this is particularly true in Western Europe, say in Britain or in France, um, Germany, Spain, you say something negative about Obama, they go, and it's almost like they've all somehow, it's an interesting sociological phenomenon, they've all learned the same phrase about Obama. They will say, but he's such a gentleman. 
almost word for word. But he is such a gentleman. There's something in our sinful natures, in our own wickedness, that creates in us an unwillingness to see an individual for who they are, provided they have a veneer of civility. Some of the greatest criminals in history were quite charming individuals. I last summer read several memoirs by those who were in Adolf Hitler's circle. Uh, his driver, his valet, I just finished reading a, um, a biography about Ava Braun. And we don't get Hitler at all. The way we portray Hitler is we practically give him in every movie, in every documentary on the History Channel or some such thing. Hitler's presented as, you know, like the devil. He's presented with... with a pitchfork and horns as a man who is quite obviously evil. But you see, he is really like the devil who isn't like that. The devil presents himself, Scripture tells us, as an angel of light. As an angel of light. He disguises himself as to who he really is. And this is Barack Obama. Barack Obama is the devil himself. And that is because he's quite skillful, unlike, again, an AOC. AOC is an idiot, in my opinion. She is not bright. She's not intelligent. Ilhan Omar is. She is. And it's what makes her very, very dangerous. She's quite devious. She's very clever in hiding who she is. AOC can't help but just let it all spill out as to who she actually is. And because of her love for attention and her love for, so, love for social media attention, it just adds to the fact that she vomits out all kinds of silly things. But that's not Ilhan Omar. She's much more careful. She's much more calculating. And it isn't Barack Obama. Barack Obama is very, very devious in presenting who he is. You know, he ran as a Christian. Do you remember that? He ran as a Christian. He also said as late as 2010, I think it was, that he did not believe in gay marriage. You knew that he did. It's come out, there's more and more evidence that has come out that Obama is gay or at least bisexual. More and more evidence to that effect. That his life is full of sexual perversion. But he presents himself as a gentleman. He presents himself as a man of the people. But Dinesh titled his book rightly, The Roots of Obama's Rage. The man is full of rage. And part of what he hates, he hates, not, he's not just an anti-imperialist, he is anti-American to his core. And he hates the American people, and he sees himself as an agent of retribution. It is important that you understand this, ladies and gentlemen. There is a huge difference. There are elements within the American church, pardon me for just a moment, I know not everybody who listens to this podcast is a, you know, is a Christian, but you can still learn something from this. Right now, there is a major power struggle going on in American churches, not just, not just evangelical churches, not just Protestant churches, but also within the Catholic church. And that is a major power struggle between those that I will call um, the, the radical left and those people who are adhere, at least in the Catholic church, would adhere to more traditional uh, Catholic dogma and in evangelical churches who adhere, I hope, to the Word of God, to the Bible, to Scripture. There's a massive power struggle that is going on there. And a lot of that centers around something called social justice. You've all heard the term. You've heard it a million times. Ladies and gentlemen, social justice is not justice. It is Marxism in disguise. It is Marxism in disguise. It's like Obama. It's like the devil. It presents itself as one thing, but it's absolutely 
something else. It is 100% evil. 100% evil. And social justice, it is important that you understand this, dear Christian. Social justice is not Christian. It isn't Christian. And that is because the gospel is about repentance, forgiveness, God's grace, restoration, healing, not just at a vertical level with other men, with other people, but a horizontal level. It's about reconciliation with God himself. It's about eternal life. It's about, again, the grace of God. Social justice has none of that in it. Social justice isn't about grace. It's not about forgiveness, not about restoration. It is about retribution. It is about revenge. It is about punishment. It is about destruction. It is about placing people in the dock for crimes that are perceived or real, historic, your aunt, whatever, and laying the blame, the weight of all that history on you for the purpose of what? To seek healing? To seek reconciliation? To forgive? No. To seek your destruction and to seek power. It's about power, ladies and gentlemen. Do not. You know, our, our coaches used to always say to us, you know, you play football, and forgive me, it's football season, so my mind is on football. Man, do I love college football. NFL, less so. But I love college football. And I played football all the way from elementary school through middle school through high school. And our coaches would often say to us, you know, when you're going to tackle a man when he's running at you, to kind of keep your eyes on his chest. The ball hitting his chest. And that's because whatever he's doing with his arms or whatever he's doing with his eyes, he's not going to go anywhere that he doesn't turn himself. He's going to turn himself. Don't watch his, don't, don't watch his eyes. Watch, watch his core. Because he can look over here and fool you. And he pulled a Patrick Mahomes. You know, Patrick Mahomes, so incredible. He'll look over here and he'll throw it over there. Now, not many people can do that, but Patrick Mahomes could flat do it. But it's a little bit like this. Meaning that social justice is looking this way, fooling you with sleight of hand, while over here they're seizing your wallet and they're seizing power. This is Barack Obama. This is who he is. Remember Michelle Obama's gaffe? Do you remember this? Where the cameras caught her, you could lip read her seeing, and it is during, I can't remember what event this is for. I don't know if this is inauguration or it was a July the 4th ceremony, Memorial Day, what it was, but there is... There is um, a real outpouring of patriotism in the American flag. And you hear her saying this, all this for a damn flag. You remember that? You can find this on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. That's not her speaking. That's her husband speaking through her or him, if you think he's Mike. <laughs> A lot of people believe, a lot of people, talk about a conspiracy theory, talk about a rabbit hole. There are people who believe that Michelle Obama is not a woman, but is a man. I'm not prepared to go to that place, but there are people who do believe that. And honestly, some of the time it is, it is actually kind of funny. But the hate that you rightly sense emanating from Washington, D.C., for red state America, it is, Bi it is Obama, not Biden. And that's because those states hold dear those values which have traditionally defined America, God, family, patriotism. And for the right price, Biden will love or hate all of those things. He'll love or hate red states. He'll do what he needs to do. Now, we have another piece of evidence here that points to Obama as the puppeteer. The Churchill bust, again, Obama removed it. Trump put it back in the Oval Office. Biden, one of his first acts as president of the United States was to remove it, and he replaced it with a bust of Caesar 
Chavez, who was a Marxist labor agitator. He was a thug. Now, this most definitely points to Obama. In 2014, Obama proclaimed Caesar Chavez Day. Caesar Chavez Day. Even CNN, CNN, not Fox News, not Breitbart, was aghast when he declared a Caesar Chavez Day. CNN put out a headline that says, Obama hits a foul by honoring Caesar Chavez. They would never say that now, but they did. They had the courage to say it way back in 2012. And uh, oh, by, uh, um, oh, Biden, oh, Biden, did we coin something here or somebody else already come up with that? Anyway, Obama in declaring Caesar Chavez Day, you, you, you learned something about who Obama was, that this was something that mattered to him. Well, guess what? Obama, Caesar Chavez Day, Biden becomes president, removes Churchill, puts a bust of Caesar Chavez in the Oval Office, and then Biden, or I should say his handlers, tweeted this. Ob Obama probably wrote this tweet. When I became president, meaning Biden, I proudly placed a bust of Cesar Chavez in the Oval Office to serve as a reminder of the values he embodied, the vision of freedom he fought for, and the commitment to justice and dignity that we must uphold each and every day. Happy Cesar Chavez Day. We have no finer role model than Cesar Chavez. That's not Biden. I promise you, that is not Biden. That is Obama. That's not George Soros. That's not Bill Gates. That's not some globalist cabal. That, that's Obama. That's Obama the puppeteer. Chavez, as I said, was a thug. A thug who should not be honored in any way, shape, or form. Any more than we would honor, say, Karl Marx, or Mao, or Hitler, or Stalin. But it should come as no surprise to us that Chavez was an Obama mentor. He was a mentor to the young Obama. And both Chavez and Obama were, in turn, deeply influenced by evil Marxist theorist and agitator Saul Alinsky. Now, we've devoted a podcast to Saul Alinsky, you know, who wrote the books Rules for Radicals and Reveille for Radicals. Rules for Radicals is by far the more influential of the two books. And Hillary Clinton, now Hillary Clinton, you know, knew Alinsky. Now, now Obama never did. Obama never met Alinsky. But he was, in a sense, mentored by Alinsky by, prox by proxy through guys like Cesar Chavez. They were both big fans of his. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not making anything up here. This is not conspiracy theory. It's all easily ascertained with a bit of thoughtful research. So if you're wondering who the proverbial power behind the throne is, these acts indicate that it is none other than Barack Hussein Obama. You still doubt me? Watch this interview of Obama. This is an astonishing interview with Stephen Colbert. I've, I've said this before. I, 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 uh, pe people would ask me, knowing what you know now, do you wish like you had a, sec a, a third term? Um, and I, I used to say, you know what? If, if I could make an arrangement where um, I had a, I had a, a stand-in, a front man, or front woman, and, and they had an earpiece in, and I was just in my basement in my sweats, mm -hmm. looking through the stuff, and then I could sort of deliver the lines, but somebody else was uh, doing all the talking and ceremony. Wow. I, I'd be fine with that. That's an incredible admission. I think some real power brokers saw that interview and said, you know what? That's not a half bad idea. I think I think we could arrange that. Why not have a third Obama term? What we are seeing with Joe Biden is a third Obama 
term. Now, moving forward, here is my prediction. Obama is using Biden to push through the most radical and unpopular policies. The embarrassing withdrawal from Afghanistan, where we left thousands of Americans. A ruinous economic policies, the war in Ukraine, attacks on the First and Second Amendments, and they are attacking the First and Second Amendments relentlessly. Free speech and um, the right to bear arms. They're coming for all those. They're coming for the Bill of Rights, actually, um, which is what? Freedom of religion, assembly, press, petition, and speech. They're coming for all of those. Are coming for them all. Vaccine mandates, ESG, trans rights, the indictment of Trump. Obama, in my view, is using Biden as a front man, as a fall guy to push through all of these things that the left wants. And then they're going to discard him. I do not personally believe that Obama, excuse me, that Biden will be permitted to run for president in 2024, unless they use him again like a John Fetterman type, just a guy who's just, you know, he's just not at all there. He's just a Dianne Feinstein who has no idea. Mitch McConnell has no idea where he is. And they just continue to sock puppet him. That's a possibility. It's a real possibility. And they know that a certain core element of the Democratic Party is going to vote for him no matter what. He could be Bernie. He could be the dead guy, literally the dead guy. And the left, the radical left, there's a core on the left that will still vote for him, no matter what. But my guess is that they're using him to push through all of these policies so that they can then go, oh, we had no idea, no idea that Biden was so corrupt. You know, we're seeing more, the media is starting to cover this a little bit more. And I don't think that's by coincidence. I think they're teeing up Biden for a catastrophic fall so that they can, well, I'll be doggone. Guess, guess he was getting money out of Ukraine. Guess he was getting money from China. Guess he was corrupt. Guess Hunter Biden is a pretty awful human being. We need to get rid of him. And when you see the left starting to say things like that, you must know that it is part of an orchestrated effort not to move on to the truth, not to move on to something better, but to move on to the next candidate, whoever that candidate is. It might be Michelle Obama. It might be Gavin Newsom. Who knows? Gavin Newsom is being prepared, being groomed for the presidency of the United States. Imagine having that guy. If you could go from worse, go, you're going to go to something worse than Joe Biden, it would be Gavin Newsom, I think. But my own prediction is that Biden is being used to push through all of these extremely unpopular policies, and there will be more. And then they can discard him and say, yeah, he went too far. He went too far. Now you need to vote for this candidate. You need to vote for this person. And it allows Obama to maintain a safe distance and go, oh, shock horror. I had no idea. Wow, gosh, the lockdowns oh, were a little harsh. Yeah, maybe the we overreacted to the pandemic. Maybe Joe went too far. It allows Obama to keep a safe distance. Now, who will the candidates be? Well, as I say, I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it's Michelle Obama at some point. Certainly wouldn't be shocked if it is Gavin Newsom. Would it be a Kamala? Now, while the puppet masters want someone they can control, they don't want someone like Kamala Harris, who is just too stupid. She's just too stupid. The woman is asked a question and she laughs. She can be asked about a plane crash and she will laugh. She can be asked about a, main, uh, uh, a mass shooting and she will laugh laugh she is she is she's further gone mentally she has a lower iq right now in complete health than biden does in a state of rapid onset of dementia 
I don't think it'll be her. Regardless of who it is, don't be fooled. As regents once ruled on behalf of adolescent or feeble-minded kings or queens, so it is now. Obama is the real president of the United States. That fact must be understood. But this leads us to a very interesting corollary. Who's controlling Obama? <laughs>